Uh, I'm Homan, I'm the lead data scientist at Datadog, and it's nice to be back in Austin. I actually um, did my postdoc here, so it's been a while since. <laughs> um, yeah, so, oops. All right, there. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about um, how we use outlier and anomaly detection at Datadog to monitor our systems in real time. Um, and so to um, motivate the problem, I'm gonna first go over um, monitoring and alerting. And then I'm gonna make the distinction between what we call outliers and anomalies. Um, and then we'll get to the meat of the talk where we talk about the algorithms that we use for outlier and anomaly detection. Um, yeah. All right, so um, at Datadog, we like to use the analogy that running software in production without monitoring is like driving without visibility. You have no idea how to stay on the road or that you're about to crash. So Datadog is a cloud-based service for monitoring servers, databases, applications, and tools. Um, and the best way to, we think that the best way to monitor any complex system is to collect as many metrics as you can from all of them uh, at a sufficiently fine granularity and so that, that way you can see any important changes in your metrics. Um, so thousands of companies send us their metrics every day, and we, um, pub we process like hundreds of billions of points a day. So uh, here's an example of a dashboard of metrics. Um, and just by being able to display the metri metrics we collect in a coherent fashion, uh, you can gain a lot of insight into what's actually going on with your service. So like in this case, something funny is going on with that yellow line over there. Um, and so yeah, the dashboards are great, uh, except you can't have people staring at them 24 hours a day. Um, and as your system gets more and more complicated, you're gonna collect more metrics and you'll actually care about more of the metrics than you can possibly even look at. And so that's where automated alerting come in, comes in. Um, so the most common types of alerts are threshold alerts. And so say a metric goes above a, some threshold a certain amount of time and then an alert will go off. And so for some metrics such as disk space, this is pretty obvious what you wanna do. You'll wanna set it at something like 80%, um, and then that way when it hits that threshold, you'll have enough time to clear out some disk space before the machine crashes. Um, and for other metrics, um, maybe you just understand a lot about their behavior, right? So f from past experience, you know that um, if this metric goes to 1.5K, things go bad. And so then you set the threshold there and alert against it. Um, there are other metrics where you just might have no idea what the normal behavior might be. And for other metrics, uh, you have a, actually a good understanding of what normal means, but the baselines just change over time. Um, so this metric, whatever it is, but it, it clearly measures some sort of user behavior, right? It goes up during the middle of the weekdays, uh, less activity over the weekends, and it looks like there's more activity over time, so the metric is trending up. Um, so for both of these types of metrics, it's con it can be impossible to set threshold alerts without getting false, false alarms all the time. So um, to deal with cases where threshold alerts aren't enough, we turn to outlier detection and anomaly detection. So um, both types of alerts take advantage of information available to us that doesn't get used by simple threshold alerts. So for outlier detection, we compare metrics that should be behaving similarly to one another. So um, and for anomaly detection, we're gonna be using the metric's past history to see whether or not it's deviating, deviating from where we think it should be. So um, outlier detection is something like uh, one of these things is not like the others, and for anomaly detection, it's, it's not acting the way it used to. Um, unfortunately, this, like, these, uh, the nomenclature here is not standardized at all. So um, when I say outlier detection, I'm always gonna mean like one of these things is not, not like the others. Anomaly detection is always a history-based, you're not acting like you're used to. Um, Twitter and Netflix share our terminology. Yahoo does exactly the opposite. So it's just the way things are. Um, all right, so first I'm gonna go over outlier detection. Um, all right, so just to remind you, for outlier detection, we're gonna, we wanna automatically identify any host or group of hosts that's acting um, abnormally compared to its peers. And so this method of alerting is like really useful for things that are prone to spikes, um, where the baselines are fluctuating, and in particular if they don't follow any parent seasonal behavior. 
So this following here is like a nice example um, where we used outlier detection at Datadog to show an issue. Um, for, uh, these lines all represent a set of servers for a particular app, and they're all supposed to be doing exactly the same thing, um, except that our outlier monitor went off and it showed that there was a small group that was doing something different. It took us a while to figure out what it was, but it just turns out that um, there was just like a slight difference in their operating system. Um, and once we resolved that, they all went up and started doing the same thing again. But this is the kind of thing that you never would have caught before, um, either with threshold alerts or you know, even with manual inspection, I doubt like this is the kind of thing we, might not, we would have noticed. So we offer the choice of uh, two different algorithms for our outlier detection. Uh, one's called MAD, which stands for the mediate, median absolute deviation from the median. And the other is DBSCAN, which stands for density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise. Um, we tested about like a half dozen different algorithms, but we chose those two because they were the most robust. So robust algorithms are less influenced by just one-off outliers or one-off, sorry, one-off spikes. Um, and things that like, you don't really care about. Um, and we also preferred algorithms where the user was responsible as for setting as few parameters as possible. And we wanted to make sure that those parameters were very intuitive for the users to set. So um, let's go over the MAD algorithm first, just because the MAD itself is like the quintessential example of a robust statistic. Um, so the median absolute deviation from the median is, so you have a data set of um, things D, capital D. You take the median of that data set, right? So that's just like the middle value. Um, the deviations are how far each thing is from the median. Take the absolute value and take the median of that. Um, I think it's constructive to just do a quick example. So say your data set is one, two, three, four, five, six, and 100. So the median value there is four. Those are the deviations, right? Just subtract all those numbers from four. Take their absolute values. And the median of that set is two. Right. And so um, notice, so, so two is going to be like, the, uh, the MAD represents kind of like the robust measure of the variability in that data set. And so notice that like, um, even if that 100 was 1,000 or a million, that the MAD would still be two. And you want to contrast this with the standard deviation, which is 33.8 in this case. And you can make that arbitrary larger by turning that 100 into 1,000 or a million. All right, so um, that's what the MAD is. How do we use that to do outlier detection? So what we're going to do is say you have a bunch of time series. Um, so in this particular window, we're going to look at the data set of every single, point in um, every single point of every single time series within that window. That's our data set. We're going to find the median value. And that's going to be that solid purple line going through the middle there. And then we'll calculate the MAD from that, of that data set, multiply it by some normalizing factor and a tolerance parameter, which the user can set, um, so in this case, three. And then that plus minus the median will be those um, dashed lines there. And so then anything that, any, um, any point in time where a series goes above or below those dashed lines will be outlier points. And then we're going to say that a time series itself is an outlier if a certain percentage of its points are outlier points. Um, and so like that percentage we usually send to something like 10 or 20. Um, yeah, so that's it for the MAD algorithm. The other algorithm that we have is dbscan. Um, right, I guess a natu if you think you want to group things from things that are like each other to things that are not like each other. Clustering is a natural thing to do. Um, and dbscan is just a very popular density-based clustering algorithm. Um, and it's, it's popular because unlike most clustering algorithms, you don't have to specify beforehand exactly how many clusters you're looking for. Um, and then, oh, and then like the other nice thing about dbscan is that it doesn't even, it doesn't try to cluster every single point. So it's happy to say that these things are clustered together and some things are just not in any cluster whatsoever. So traditionally, um, dbscan takes two parameters, epsilon and a min samples parameter. So epsilon um, just specifies what, how far points have to be from each other to be considered close. Um, and then min samples is the number of 
points that have to be close to a point before that point can start doing agglomerating. So uh, let's just take a look at this picture. I think it'll be clearer. Um, we have a bunch of points in 2D. Uh, there are two clusters, the blue and the purple one. Um, the larger points are ones that have at least min samples points within its epsilon radius. Um, and so those, those guys have started like greedily grabbing points. Colored points that aren't big are ones that are close to big points that are colored, but don't have themselves enough points in their epsilon radius to do any gobbling themselves. And then black points are all points that are far away from any of the large points. So um, that's how dbscan works. It's a simple greedy algorithm. And it's great that you don't have to specify the number of clusters, but set, um, as like should be obvious from this example, like setting epsilon is going to be the thing that's kind of going to be very hard to do, and it's going to require like having some knowledge of your data set to do it well. So, um, how do we do this for time series data? So, um, let's say with this particular time window, each time series has d points in it. Um, and in this particular case, there are seven different time series. Um, so we're going to look at each time series as being a d-dimensional point. So we just have seven points here, and we're going to try to cluster them. Um, and we're going to get rid of that min samples parameter by just letting every point cluster. And we're only going to be interested in finding the biggest cluster. And anything outside of the biggest cluster we'll consider an outlier. So we got rid of most of the parameters. Now we just have to set epsilon. So, um, we're going to calculate a new series called, we just call the median series, and it's just going to be a tick by tick median. So like each point, each, uh, at each time point of the, the median series is just the median of those seven points at that time. Um, so, so once we have the median time series, we're going to calculate the distance between each time series and the median time series. And in that picture, you can see that for most of the time series, it's going to be really close to the median time series, so the distance will be close to zero. Um, that one outlier up there is going to be far away because it's always above the median series. And then for epsilon, we set it to be the median of the distances to the median series. And in that case, since most of them are close to the median series, like that epsilon will be close to zero. And then once again, we multiply it by the normalizing parameter and the tolerance parameter. Um, so yeah, note this, it's, like, it's pretty similar to MAD in how we set the distances. All right. um, so for most outliers, both algorithms perform pretty well. Um, you just set the tolerance parameter to be like three or two, um, depending on how many standard, like robust standard de deviations you want it to be away before it is considered an outlier. Um, but there's subtle cases where like one algorithm is more appropriate than the other. Um, so I guess one thing to note is for the MAD algorithm, we just kind of considered all the time point, all the points in a big batch, and didn't really consider the time as a factor at all. Whereas for dbscan, we only consider points that are at the same time tick and compare those to each other. So um, for this example, like let's say these are um, buffers that are flushing, right? So um, a bunch of the bunch of them all flush around the same time, and there's one that's like flushing way later. And for dbscan, this would be considered an outlier, right? Because um, that, I guess, like between like 6:25 and 6:30, that orange line is just very far away from all the other ones. Whereas MAD, which doesn't consider the time part at all, will not call anything an outlier because that set of points is all around the same, around the same values. And so for buffer flushing, like you probably don't care what time they flush, so you probably want to use MAD because you don't want to call, you don't want to call that an outlier. Then the fact that they're all flushing together is probably just because they happen to be restarted at the same time or something. Um, but now, like, pretend, let's pretend that instead of um, buffers flushing, these are some sort of time job that are all supposed to like go go off around the same time and end at the same time. In this case, you would want that orange line to be considered an outlier, and so then you'd rather be using dbscan than MAD. Um, so given how our algorithms are defined, um, they don't work very well if you're, the group of time series that you're looking at have several natural groupings. And so in that case, you're much better off just 
doing outlier detection on each of the natural groupings separately. So um, with the use of robust statistics, we've taken a lot of guesswork out of how you set the parameters. But um, unfortunately, there's like a shadow parameter, which is the length of the time window. Um, the larger it is, the more robust you'll be, but the later it'll be um, before you get alerted to an outlier. But the shorter it is, the more prone you are to one-off spikes. And this is, I think, just like the nature of alerting. Like, you, you can't help but have this issue. Um, and so like, here, this time window, you have it here, and like, you might not be able to see it, but there's like a spike that happens at the very end, and it's not considered an outlier. And then you, sh you shorten the window ever so slightly, and that becomes an outlier. And so this is just a, uh, an issue with alerting. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's it for the outlier portion of the talk. Um, I guess I could take questions now if you have them for it, or I can just move on into anomaly detection. All right, I'll move on to anomaly detection for now. All right, so um, for anomaly detection, we're gonna alert if a metric deviates from what we think it should be doing based on its past behavior. Um, and so we're gonna just represent this by drawing an envelope around the time series, and that's gonna represent what we think the upper bound and lower bound for the expected behavior is. Um, and then anytime it goes outside of that envelope, we're gonna call it an anomaly. And so here it's just visually represented by being red as opposed to blue. And so this is just great for metrics that are trending up and down or metrics that have seasonal behavior like this. And so, um, of course, the primary benefit of this is that you can then alert if the metric becomes anomalous. Um, and so like some people like to think of anomaly detection as just being able to automatically set thresholds for a metric. And which is great because you don't have to worry about setting thresholds. This machine learning algorithm will do it for you. And then, of course, this can also be terrible because you can get woken up in the middle of the night by a machine learning algorithm um, for some like, inscrutable reason. Um, and so in this case, you get woken up. It's clear that the metric is outside the envelope, but why was the envelope even put there in the first place? So for this reason, we make sure to give you the historical context of that metric so that you can kind of see what's going on and, and kind of guess why that envelope might have been even put there. Right, so in this case, you can see that um, the value of this metric is lower than it's ever been for the past week or even the past seven weeks. So it gives you, kind of, it gives you confidence that the metric really is anomalous. Um, and you can kind of see also why that, um, why that envelope is put around where it is because that's the value that the metric tends to be at that time of day um, across a week or even mostly for like the seven weeks. So, um, so how, do, how do we create these envelopes? Unfortunately, it's not as simple as just looking at the mean for the past you know, X amount of time and looking at the standard deviation, or even using the more robust uh, median and mad like we did with outliers. All right, so if, you, if we use like a method like that, then this like increase of like around 100% um, at 3 a.m. there like would be considered anomalous. But if you zoom out, you're, you can see that there's in fact like spikes every four hours. So this is actually like perfectly normal behavior. And so, um, yeah, instead you really want to consider the whole, whole history of the metric, right? Um, and you, you want to know that like this is the kind of metric where the weekends have less activity than weekdays, or maybe like nights might have less variability than um, days as well. So um, how do we use this history? So uh, the first algorithm that we have, which we have imaginatively um, titled robust, um, is just gonna take a page from traditional uh, time series literature. Um, and we're gonna de decompose the series into several components. Um, but before we do that, we're gonna detect the periodicity of the series. And so for this particular series, this, ha this has a weekly seasonality. So um, given that original series, we're gonna find like a trend component, which captures the longer term direction of the series and its growth rate. The seasonal component, which takes into account the periodicity of it. And then finally, the noise component. Um, so we take great care to make sure that the way we um, decompose this into these three components is done as robustly as possible. And this is so that like, if there's any anomalous points in the past history, that doesn't skew the results. And 
this is really hard to do for the, the noise component because the distinction between what's noise and what's anomalous, like what's anomalous and what's noise is, is a pretty fine distinction. Um, so I keep saying like, it's, it's important to use robust statistics. And so let me give this example of why. Um, so say you have this metric that's going along and it's all of a sudden it shoots out of the envelope, keeps going up. And we see that it had this huge spike and then there was a secondary spike and we marked both of those as being anomalous, which is great. Um, this might be hard to make out, but like the metric actually returns back to its normal level and we continue to mark it as being anomalous. So why is that? Let's zoom back in. And so we see what happens is that um, we expect that metric to be slightly higher than um, it was, even though it's actually normal. And the reason for that is if we use like a trender that is something like, say, like say a rolling average, then we'll have incorporated that large spike into our calculations, and then that will have moved our expected value for that metric up, and we'll, we'll call it anomalous even though it's not. And so if we, however, if we had used a robust um, trending up, a trender, then it would be back at the actual level. And so then it, wouldn't, it would correctly say that it went back to normal. Um, so our robust algorithm is, um, lives up to its name. It's extremely robust. Um, but sometimes it can be too robust. Um, so here's an example where uh, this metric, uh, whatever it is, like we released some co code change, and it just brought down the baseline by 10K. Um, and the robust algorithm does its job and just keeps plugging along and saying that that's the normal value. Um, and so it, it, marks, it marks the metric um, in recent times as being anomalous, even though it's because of this code change. And so it just doesn't deal with level shifts that will at all. Um, eventually, it'll go down and, and meet and realize that this is the new normal, but it takes a while for that to happen. So um, our second algorithm which we uh, have dubbed adaptive, um, deals with level, things like level shifts much better. Um, so the way this works is unlike the robust algorithm where we have a single seasonality, it tries, um, comes up with these forecasts using all like, possible seasonalities it can think of. So then what, what it's gonna do is it's gonna use an agnostic online learning algorithm to weight each of the forecasts. Um, and, so, and the weights are gonna change with each passing tick. So like, let's, for this series, let's say, let's pretend it had a weekly seasonality. Um, and so most of the weight is gonna be on like a forecast with weekly seasonality. But then that we release that code change and all of a sudden that, that forecast is just doing terribly. Um, so then slowly, as with each patch, passing tick, it'll start shifting more and more weight to let's say something with an hourly seasonality until all, most of the weight is gonna be like on the hourly seasonality forecast, in which case it'll start giving the correct answer and we have shifted down again. And so using this, we can um, adapt to changes that are happening in a time series much quicker. But at the same time, we wanna uh, be robust to anomalies, and so um, we use, that's why we use an agnostic learning algorithm. So agnostic learning is the learning theory counterpart to um, robust, uh, robustness in statistics. So simple, we don't wanna like follow the series so closely that we follow along with every single anomaly. Um, so both algorithms just have a single parameter, uh, which is the tolerance, um, and it's gonna just specify basically how fat you like your envelopes to be. Um, and this is gonna be really set according to how much deviation you feel comfortable with before setting off an alert. Um, and once again, as with outlier detection, the, the size of the time window you decide to alert on is gonna be very important. Um, right, so I'd like to end by saying that it could be just really tempting to turn on anomaly detection for all of your metrics, um, but this is just something you shouldn't actually do. Um, you should always focus on metrics that are like symptoms of things that you actually care about, right? Like um, 500 errors or memory issues. Um, and if you had like a crazy metric like this one here and you get an alert saying that it's been anomalous for the past five minutes, there's like very little you can do with that information. So um, these algorithms are great um, and they're powerful, but you really should use them judiciously for things that you actually care about. 
Um, so the anomaly dete uh, outlier detection is in use by all of our customers right now, and it's been out for a while. Anomaly detection is actually just in a beta right now, so it's only a few, few of our customers who are using it. Um, and that adaptive algorithm that I presented is, has only just been released. Um, some things that we're looking at for future work are things like holiday detection. So like things that only happen once a year are not things that we pick up very well because we don't look more than a year away in the past history. Um, yeah, but then you have to deal with like international, internationalization and all that. Um, another thing we want to deal with is like a metric like this that has like very little history. Um, right now, since anomaly detection is based on looking at the history, if you have very little history, it doesn't work well at all. Um, and also being, having the user be able to specify that like a particular period of time is the normal behavior and instead of having the machine, the out learning algorithm just trying to pick it up by itself. So um, that's it, thank you very much. I think we have some time for questions if you have any. Hi, uh, did Hi. you consider um, doing something with um, um, either time frequency analysis or wavelet transforms to, or um, Fourier, uh, fast Fourier transforms? Okay. Can you say that list again? Um, the, the basic one would be fast, fast Fourier transform, next one would be wavelet transform, and a more sophisticated one would be time frequency analysis. Yeah, so um, for all of, uh, we've tried them. Um, there's probably still like, we probably haven't squeezed all the possible juice out of it, but the largest problem we found with it is that it just, you're just taking the transform of the actual series, so a lot of times it just follows the anomalies and um, like something like a big spike like I showed, it'll just model that big spike and then it'll, it, won't, it won't call it anomalous at all. So that's, that's the largest problem we've had with those transforms. So, so the way you would do it is you would do the FFT, then you would use a window, you would isolate the, the, the noisy um, part, and then you would do a reverse Fourier transform, and you put next to so your it's signal, good at, subtract it, and yeah. then you would get it. <laughs> uh, it's, good, it's good at finding, like, like getting rid of like that kind of noise. It's terrible at get, like, um, not just considering that, like, if like a, a, if you have a metric that's just straight and then like goes up, right? It'll just it'll it'll just model that going up perfectly well. Um, Hello. I was wondering if you had uh, recommendations of open source tools to do this kind of stuff. Um. So. We're, we're mostly a Python shop, so um, so for Python, there's like the stats model, um, and like I think there's like a new version of stats model that is just released or about to be released that has a lot of nice um, implementations of the more traditional time series decomposition stuff and like or things like um, ARIMA type algorithms. Um, the largest problem I found with that once again is that they also tend to just model anomalies. Um, it's, it's hard, I think, um, for, for a lot of these algorithms, it's very hard to be able to look at, like, say, like, these things happen, right? Like, your system has a bad day. Um, and so then, and you basically don't want to consider that bad day in your model at all. And there aren't that many algorithms out there that know how to deal with things like a whole, an entire bad day and not include that part of the model without you explicitly just removing it from your data. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like largely the reasons we had, decided, we had to roll our own. Hi, I was Hi. wondering how well does this handle incomplete data? Like how robust is it against maybe chunks of data that you have and then you have some missing for a few months or something yeah. like that? Um, 
So that, that actually turns out to be um, turned out to be the biggest pain. <laughs> um, yeah, this just happens a lot. We have, we have like incomplete data, like people. We have these agents that are installed on the machines that are sending us metrics, but people will turn it off and then like they'll turn it on again, um, or you just you brought your whole system down to do maintenance and you brought it up again. And so basically, just dealing with like NANs, it was like probably sp like half the time we spent on that. <laughs> like it's, but uh, I think we deal with it pretty well. Um, we still have like the the if we just don't have any history, then like it doesn't work that well at all. Um, and the, the more history you get, the better it works. But like things like patchiness and gaps, I think I think hopefully that we've covered like all the cases. But how do you handle elastic systems in outlier detection? Uh, and what? In when you're doing outlier detection, how do you handle elastic? Oh. Systems, so we're we're bringing nodes up and down, in and out, all the time. Um, so that's actually like fine for us. Um, so we like kind of like we always consider just I don't know. Like let's take that animated GIF example. Like um, the way we monitor something like this is that say like these are tagged with like I don't know elastic group one or something. Um, and so the actual host might change over time, but we're always monitoring anything that's tagged with that particular group. And for outlier detection, we're just freezing it in a moment in time and looking at a particular time window, and then we'll do that outlier detection like that, and then we'll move it forward a tick, do it again. And so if new hosts come online while that happens, it's like it's fine. Um, I guess w uh, one thing that could happen is that. Um, a new host might come online like in the middle of it, and so see like like this, you have a bunch of lines going like this, but one host is ramping up, um, and so we've like put in special logic just to deal with that case to say that even though it looks like an outlier, um, you shouldn't call it an outlier because it's just a host ramping up and joining the group. But if it takes it a long time to ramp up, then we'll end up, probably end up calling it an outlier. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much.